Hey guys, so my name is William Solomon. Thanks for joining me today. First, I want to start off talking a little bit about the history of the pharmaceutical industry. Now, a lot of people don't know the pharmaceutical industry actually has its origins in Germany. And this is why many of the pharmaceutical companies today, Pfizer, Bayer, Merck, um, they actually derive from Germany. Um, and this is because chemistry, in particular organic chemistry, was very advanced in Germany. And so you had a lot of the basic understanding of how molecules work, how science work from a chemical perspective, really beginning in Germany. Matter of fact, uh, our current educational system in the United States is based on the German system. So Germany really had a very high impact in terms of its, of its role in shaping today's pharmaceutical industry. Now, I'm sure you know what pharmaceutical industries do and pharmaceutical companies do, but ultimately what they do is research, develop, produce, and distribute medications. Uh, unfortunately, over the last probably 10 to 15 years, they've had a pretty bad reputation when it comes to um, their role um, in potentially uh, influencing or restricting access to certain medications because drug prices are so high. And that's been, you know, uh, it's kind of just a bad rap that pharmaceutical companies have had. Uh, but it's a major industry. It's probably one of the largest industries in the world. Uh, to give you an idea, in 2021, the pharmaceutical industry had a revenue that totaled worldwide over 1.42 trillion U.S. dollars. That's right, 1.42 trillion U.S. dollars. Now, when we talk about the life sciences industry versus the pharmaceutical industry, what are the differences? The life sciences industry encompasses other areas um, within the sphere. So we're talking about things like biotechnology, diagnostics industry, the medical device industry. These industries are working in tandem with the pharmaceutical industry and involved in the overall healthcare ecosystem. But when I refer to the pharmaceutical industry for intents and purposes, I'm referring to the companies that manufacture and distribute and produce medicines. OK, um, because their rules and regulations are a little bit different than, for example, the diagnostics industry. They're, they're kind of under different regulatory uh, environment. I think one of the reasons why uh, the work that we do at the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs or the ACMA, why it's been so successful is that there are many opportunities for many different types of individuals who want to work in the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, in particular, the I think one of the fastest growing areas of the pharmaceutical industry is an area known as medical affairs, which I'm going to get into more detail later. But this is an area that's been particularly appealing to pharmacists, uh, PhD professionals, medical doctors who uh, still want to work in healthcare and be steeped in the science, but want to do it from a business standpoint. And so medical affairs has afforded them this opportunity. But there are many opportunities in other areas within the pharmaceutical industry. And the opportunities are increasing because the baby boomers are aging. And so there's an increase in chronic disease prevalence overall. Um, why do people want to work in the pharmaceutical industry? Simply put, it is a very lucrative industry from a financial perspective. Pharmaceutical companies pay typically higher on average than other industries. There's a lot of flexibility and benefits. The other reason people want to work in the pharmaceutical industry oftentimes is that they're driven and motivated by a greater sense or mission to do good in the world. Um, yes, it's great to make a lot of money, and that's always fantastic, and you have great stock options when you work for pharmaceutical companies in some cases, but really it's about impacting patient lives. And what's cool about working for a pharmaceutical company is that you get to be involved in initiatives, whether it's clinical trials and other initiatives, that impact thousands or potentially millions of lives. And so there's actually also an important responsibility uh, for people that work in the pharmaceutical industry. And this is why the work we do at the ACMA is really important, because ultimately, we have to make sure that the people that work in the pharmaceutical industry are, one, competent, and two, that they're meeting certain kinds of ethical standards from an objective standpoint. And that's really important as well, that they're working compliantly and they're putting patients always top of mind. Now, what kind of jobs are there in the pharmaceutical industry? Well, there's many different types of positions in the industry, and I'll break them down based on functional area. First, we'll start with research and development, or R&D. This is really where 
we begin kind of doing the basic science to understand whether a molecule could become potentially a commercialized drug, can actually be a, a medication that goes out into the public. And this is typically where you have a lot of PhD scientists or MD, PhD professionals working in, in these companies, in the lab, kind of in the trenches. They begin by doing R&D work on animals. Uh, that's how we typically start. And then from there, if the data looks good, we begin to move on to humans. Um, there's also in vitro and vivo studies, and you can look at other videos that kind of talk about the differences there. But this is really where we do a lot of the basic science. Regulatory affairs is involved, is a functional area involved in ultimately making sure that the company is prepared to file uh, to get regulatory approval with the uh, regulatory body for that particular country. Now, in the United States, that's the Food and Drug Administration. In Europe, it's the European Medicines Agency. So it just depends on where you're located and where you're going to submit your paperwork, really, to get uh, approval. Medical affairs, which I talked about earlier, is a very fast-growing area, especially for pharmacists, PhDs, and medical doctors. That's an area that really focuses, I would say, on two primary things, the generation of data once the drug has been approved, and then the communication of that information to healthcare providers. But they're different than sales reps, and I'll talk about that probably in a different video, but uh, medical affairs people, because they're advanced degree individuals, they're not selling to doctors, they're educating doctors. So they have no sales quota or sales goal per se in trying to get a physician to prescribe the medication. Their job really is to simply educate and inform the physicians they have better decision-making abilities when they're treating patients. Marketing is another area. Marketing is no different than marketing in any other company, except here you're marketing products. Now, marketing within a pharmaceutical company, again, is very heavily regulated, and I'll talk about regulations later. Commercial refers to salespeople and sales operations. Uh, market access refers to making sure that the pharmaceutical company has put provisions in place so that when the drug is approved, that it has good favorability when it comes to market access. That the, that the drug is going to likely be approved and reimbursed by insurance companies. Remember that most people in the United States, for example, have private insurers through their employers. And so many of them, when they go to the pharmacy, are going to use that insurance to get their prescription medication. So pharmaceutical companies want to make sure that when the patient goes to the pharmacy, that they don't get rejected, that the insurance company is going to approve this product in a favorable way. And there's different tiers of approval within insurance companies. Again, that can be discussed in a later video. And finally, uh, patient liaisons or patient advocacy. Um, and this is another area that's become increasingly popular within a pharmaceutical company. This is an area related to how pharmaceutical companies work with patient advocacy groups. Um, more and more patients now are having a greater voice um, in terms of a seat at the table when it comes to pharmaceutical companies making decisions about everything from how they're going to market a particular product to also um, what they should study in a clinical trial. Remember, if you are a patient that has a particular disease, um, for you, you know, a particular endpoint that is being looked at a clinical trial or a particular area that we're looking at to test the drug's effectiveness is going to be more important to maybe someone who doesn't have a disease. Maybe someone who doesn't have the disease doesn't realize that this particular endpoint or thing being looked at is important. Hey guys, so be sure to stay tuned for part two of my video series and going through different departments of the pharmaceutical industry. If you like what you see and you think this content is helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.